Hi, everyone. This is Mac Pierre Louis, attorney mediator and arbitrator, and I'd like to welcome you to the topic for today. All 10 qualities needed to reconnect with family, a conversation with mediator Brett Lovett. This is part of the series, Conflict Resolution Insights from Brett Lovett's The Compassion Project and FamilyReconcile.com. Welcome. Welcome to the Lawyers and Mediators International Show and Podcast by InstantMediations.com, where we discuss law and conflict resolution topics to educate both professionals and everyday people. Catch regular episodes on YouTube, the Instant Mediations app, and anywhere you get your podcasts. Just remember, nothing in these episodes constitutes legal advice, so be sure to talk to a lawyer as cases are fact-dependent. Hey, welcome back. Mac Pierre Lee, attorney mediator and arbitrator working throughout Texas and Florida. And Natalia Wolskaczajka, advocat mediator and arbitrator from Warsaw, Poland. Hi, and I'm Brett Levitt. I'm in Southern California and I'm the founder of FamilyReconcile.com. Okay, so everyone who's watching, welcome to you. This is a special episode because today <clears throat> we are coming live to you, live streaming. Unlike the other times where we have been recording with Brett, we had been doing them pre-recorded and then publishing them at a later date. But after we've done, we've gone through 10 weeks worth of information, valuable information from Brett, we've decided to come live and do a recap show, a summary show, where we discuss all 10 of the qualities needed to reconnect with family. And so let me just give a brief, quick reason as to why Natalia and I wanted to participate with Brett on this project. So during COVID, there was a lot of brokenness, death and destruction all around us. Okay. And one of the consequences from this were family members being separated, sometimes because they couldn't go to hospitals to see their loved ones. Sometimes it was because COVID, let's admit it, made us all a little crazy, a little anxious. And so this produced a lot of family conflicts. But during that time, people wanted a way to reconnect because they realized that life is precious, that we only have this time together in this world with our loved ones. And so people wanted to make the best of it. So there was a drive, a, a decision, a desire by many to want to reconnect with family, whether it's an estranged spouse or a child that they're not speaking to or whoever, friends, family, whatever. And so Brett approached us about doing a series on what he had been working on, which is finding ways to help people reconnect because there is a big need for this in our modern society today. And this isn't new, of course. This is something that's been happening for many years, but COVID accentuated it because of the fact that we were all under lockdown and we were all separated from one another. So over the last 10 weeks, we've been visiting all these different qualities or reasons for people uh, that people need to work on to try to uh, get back together. And we're glad that Brett's come on to help us, to take us through all of these. And so without further ado, I'm going to let Brad introduce himself, give a brief biography on himself, and then explain to us a little bit more about his compassion project and familyreconcile.com. And by the way, I will uh, share the website on the screen. If you're listening to this, make sure that you go to the YouTube version of the video and check out the website, familyreconcile.com. All right, Brett, it's all yours. Please tell us a little bit more about yourself and why you decided to start up familyreconcile.com and The Compassion Project. Great. Thank you, Mac. Uh, I appreciate uh, the two of you, and uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed this series. I was hoping that uh, I was looking forward to today because I really wanted it just to be conversational, and I hope that comes across and you know, and how we interact and how we talk about this. Cause we've done a lot of work, haven't we over the last 10 weeks? I know you have, and I'm not the only one that's, uh, you know, I, I know all the other things you guys got going on. So, um, you know, I, I do appreciate my time with you. So thank you. Cause I think the collective, the collective whole of us is what makes this what it is, not just me. Um, so, you know, I have a, yes, I, I have a mediator background. I did some casework and then uh, I wanted to do more. 
And simply put, I looked into getting into teaching dispute resolution, teaching conflict management. And then from that, I segued into professional development and started teaching some, you know, general like communication programs, how to communicate better. Uh, I would do this in, in, in industry and in where, uh, wherever, uh, you know, that uh, they were interested in bettering their communication. And so out of really the professional development is where I really, in going around to these different companies, just interacting with different people, I started to see how, how much people really struggle to communicate uh, in, in a beneficial way. I, I think people want to communicate really well. I think people, I think we should give people the benefit of the doubt. I think they really want to do what, you know, they, they set out to do, but somehow all these other things that we carry with us get, gets in the way. And that's really, in a nutshell, what Family Reconcile was born out of. Um, and to, to get even more specific, I, was, I received a phone call from a family member, extended family member, who said, look, Brett, you know, you're, you know, you're a mediator. You, you know how to do all these. You know, they, you know how to talk, right? That's what they say. You know how to talk, as if they don't. But, uh, and they said, so I haven't talked to so-and-so in a while. Um, I heard they might be, uh, they might have had, you know, COVID but I'm a little bit trepidatious about getting in touch with them. Could you help me with that? That was the first seed. That was, you know, somewhere right around October, 2020. That was the first seed. I was like, okay, sure. I'll, I, you know, I can do that. And I got involved and reached out to the person. Not two weeks after that, I got another call from somebody else or an email actually saying, Hey, I, I could you help me with this particular thing? And it wasn't similar, but it wasn't too much different. And after that second one, I went, Wow, is something going on here? And I realized, well, you know, th this is an age-old problem, right? Disconnection, uh, uh, estrangement of some sort, whether it's in the family or with siblings or even with longtime friends, right? It doesn't even have to be a family member. It's an age-old problem, but what kind of struck me was COVID had really exacerbated that, that dynamic if it was already there. That's the point. If it was already there, it really, it really exacerbated it. So from that, as as concise as I can say it, you two, from that is what Family Reconcile was born from. So I started to take more of a direct action to say, how do I help? And then I combined all that experience from professional development instruction and the struggling communication styles I saw uh, from people that weren't just, you know, line workers, but all the way up to, uh, you know, presidents and, and CEOs and stuff like that. I mean, people knew how to do their business. Doesn't mean they necessarily knew how to communicate. And so I, all of that has kind of been brought together under one roof with Family Reconcile. So I am sharing your website on the screen. Again, it's familyreconcile.com. And, and I'll just read the mission real quick. Family Reconcile challenges longstanding, deeply entrenched societal or familial norms. In other words, we challenge long-standing destructive mindsets or ways of thinking that have somehow become acceptable in society by showing you a better way to communicate or to reconnect with your relationships. We do this through our six-month mentoring model by utilizing specific communication tools and skill sets combined with our unique intuition to achieve transformational results in your relationships with others and, most importantly, with yourself. And so we're looking forward to going through, you know, the content today. And uh, again, if you are listening, uh, check it out on familyreconcile.com. Everything is there on his website. Right, Natalia? Brett, we understand and uh, share your views and ideas on it. And the fact that uh, reconnecting with family, with your friends is important. And then it led you to identifying first 10 qualities that you think were needed to become reconnected, to do something to start experience the relationship that you perceived or someone might have perceived as broken or unfunctional or actually non-existing. So we've been through those past 10 weeks going through deference, gratitude, humility, vulnerability, apology, forgiveness, sincerity, kindness, integrity, and authenticity. And I know that you chose them on purpose and you also put them in the proper order. So starting with deference, can you tell us why 
you identify this as so important with uh, the problems people have nowadays and how it goes to reconnecting with families. And before you start with deference and going forward, Brett, I just wanted to remind the audience that all 10 episodes are available on the YouTube channel, Lawyers and Mediators International. And so you can go back and, and watch them all in depth. They're all uh, between 20 to 30 minutes each. And so uh, please, my apologies. Uh, please continue. No, no, no. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. So um, back to so as best to answer your, your question as possible, Natalia. Um, you know, I, the, the qualities were not, yeah, just randomly pulled. This kind of goes back to the mission statement that, that Mac read. And I appreciate you doing that, Mac. I wasn't going to do that, but the, that's really the why, right? Our mission statement is our why. So, you know, why do we create this series, right? Why did we get together? Why did I approach you? Why did we talk about this? It's the mission statement because we're challenging, we're challenging what, uh, we're challenging what I, what I see out there, what I think you see out there, what I think others see out there. Is what we talk about going to resonate with everybody? No, I know that. We do this for the people it's going to resonate with. And so it resonates with me when I look out at society and I see people struggling and they're saying, what's wrong? Because they may not even be able to articulate it, right? But they sense something. You agree with that? They, they sense something's wrong or something's amiss in society with how people are dealing with one another. I mean, just watch the news, read the newspaper, Right. Look at how people treat one another when they're driving on the road, right? I mean, just all these elements, I, I started thinking about it and I'm like, okay, um, society is pushing. I'm not saying society is bad and everybody's bad. I'm not saying that. I'm saying society in general foments an attitude. That's what this is about. It, it's driving an attitude and, and that attitude is aggression. Okay. We can call it a number of different things, but that's, there's this prevailing, pervasive attitude that runs through society. And I don't care what continent you live on. It runs through the, through the fabric of society. It's an aggression. It's a meism. It's, hey, nobody's going to look out for me but me. And, and if I'm going to get it, you know, I'm going to get ahead somehow because everybody else is getting it. You know, and it's just that pervasive attitude. And underneath that, we all try to be, oh, well, I'm a nice person or that's a nice person. You know, but that's kind of surface. This is, there's an undercurrent of real poor attitude across the, across every continent. So that's what this series is about. That's what these qualities are about. That's why these these qualities counteract if you want to apply them. Do you want to learn them? You know, does it resonate with you like I said? If you want to learn them, do you want to apply them? Do you want to apply them? They start with yourself first and then you move out from there. Then you move to your family. Then you move to applying them out in society. That was the basis here. Yes, we started with deference. What is deference? You know, we uh, and again, uh, for a more detailed understanding, please visit uh, you know the the actual. Qual and, and again, Mac, you know what, what we talked twenty to thirty minutes on that, and we touched the surface. We could have talked for hours on that. We can revisit that. So that twenty to thirty minutes on these programs isn't isn't an exhaustive understanding. It's a surface understanding. You know, but the deference, you know, the, the deference really kind of hovers around uh, um, acquiescing to others. Okay. In, in not every single instance, not being a doormat, not being taken advantage of. It's a skilled acquiescence. It's knowing, it's knowledge and knowing when to defer, when to let, do you have to win the point? Do you have to make the point? Do you have to stand out? Is it crucial to what you're doing? Right? It's, it's that cognizant understanding. That's what deference is. And if you know that and you're out in society and you don't have to win every point, well, gee, what kind of, you know, what do you think? Do you think people are going to think you're more likable or are they going to think you're an arrogant jerk? You know, that is the difference. If you can learn to practice deference, if you can understand what it is and then start making application of it, that might be the difference in your own likableness, it might be the difference in how you like yourself. And if you like yourself better, perhaps other people are going to like you. Not, not, not everybody's going to like everybody, right? We're not talking about that either. We're talking about being true to yourself, which goes into other qualities that we talked about. So let me, 
sometimes I think I talk too much here too. So I, I gotta be careful we'll be, with that. We'll be glad to interrupt because Natalia and I, we do have some, I guess, points we want to make on each one alongside you. Okay. And I remember, I remember when we were talking about deference, something that I had asked you, which was, well, deference seems to be dangerous because if you do it, won't people take advantage of you, right? Because you're going to be showing a sort of weakness and, like you said, a, like a door, like act like a doormat. And uh, that was one of the, I guess, myths in my own mind when we started this. And so, just we just need to remind people that there's um, the abusive kind of just let people walk all over you, and then there's the um, controlled kind of deference where you choose and you elect not to, like you said, win every argument for the sake of itself. So well said. And that's exactly it. That's so well said. Do, do you see the self-control that would be involved in that? Do you see the power and the strength of having that kind of command over your emotions and over how you react? That is, that is, now that is some admirable strength. And that is admirable strength. I don't see... I don't see on a regular basis every day. I don't see that with how business owners are interacting with the people. I don't see that in politics. Do you see any of that? Do you see that? I I'm sorry. You can argue the point with me if you, if you don't, if you think I'm wrong, I don't see that. I, I see you want to know, you don't know what weakness is. Weakness is being so self important to yourself that you need to win every point that you need to point the finger, that you need to make other people think that these people over here are wrong and I'm right. That's weakness. So it's, you know, that's what I'm talking about. Society is pushing this aggression and in, in self, you know, reliance and self importance. And, and I don't make any mistakes. And if there is a mistake that's made, well, guess what? It's Max fault or it's Natalia's fault, but it's never my fault. That's weakness. That that's so weak, and that's it's it's in it's pervasive in the family unit. It's pervasive in the workplace. It's pervasive in the government. It's pervasive everywhere. Again, you know, can I change the world? I hope to change the world. I'd like to change the world because I believe that this is the right way to do it. Um, you know, but it isn't dependent upon me. I can share the information. It's really dependent upon others, and in, in, in what they think of this information. And I'm just going to say what one last thing here because in deference. The reason why deference was the number one quality I chose to talk about was specifically for the second point in that discussion we talked about, which was there are only two kinds of relationships. And that's what we're talking about. All this stuff is about what? It's about relationships. So transactional versus transformational. Please visit the, the please watch the, the, that segment. If you're listening or if you, you, if you come to this program later, because that, that is really the fundamental basis for all of these qualities and why we're talking about this. It's the difference between whether or not uh, you know, we are giving and taking in a transactional way or whether we are giving or our relationships uh, are transformational. Big difference there. Thank you. And uh, going through all those qualities with you in those series, I have been surprised how they intersect one with another. After reference, we touched on gratitude, where you were exp explaining the difference between it and thankfulness. And uh, if you can tell us something more after, again, going through all 10, do you have anything specific to say about gratitude? Gratitude is wonderful, and it's, and it's often, as with all the qualities that we picked, and we picked them for a reason, it's often overlooked. So, so I'm going to be real concise with some of these qualities and some of them I may say more stuff about. Gratitude is a mindset. Again, go to, the, go to that particular segment and, and listen to, to how we laid it out. But gratitude is a mindset that's often overlooked. And it can deeply affect your relationships. If you're a grateful person, okay? If you're a grateful person, if, if, if you're a person who's who, who has the cognitive ability to look at their current circumstances, regardless of what they are, and to find things to be grateful for that deeply impacts your own relationship with yourself, and it deeply will impact your relationship with others because it's a mindset. That's what I would say about gratitude. 
So it is about noticing and then appreciating what we have around us, but also expressing that to others. And that was my understanding. And I think that this is what was so important and so difficult in all of that. Because even if we practice something, find some sort of using some other quality, integrity within us when using all that, then comes the next step, next level when we express that to other people. And then comes humility and vulnerability. And I am daring to put these two together because they always connect in my mind this way that these are the ones that really make you exposed to um, other people's views. Yes. And just, yeah, continue, Brett. Humility and vulnerability. How do they intersect? And what, how, why is it that it is so difficult for us to um, show them to other people? Why do, are we afraid of that? Yeah, so I would say, th this is how I say it, hum uh, humility and vulnerability are, are similar, right? And they're often used kind of interchangeably. They're similar, uh, I guess you could say they're born out of the same womb, but they're distinct. So, so humility, is, humility is essentially teachableness. Okay. And what, what do we mean by teachableness? It means you're open to outside input. Okay. You're open to outside input. That's why arrogant people generally are not humble people because arrogant people generally are not open, right? To outside input. So it's teachableness. That's humility. It's humility is considering others. Okay. Consideration of others more than yourself. So humility isn't thinking less of yourself. Okay. It's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking less about yourself. There's a key difference there. That's humility. So it's, it's looking at others and what you can learn from them. Vulnerability. I would, I would classify or qualify as one word openness. Okay. So, so, so vulnerability is openness. And what do we mean by openness? Openness is, it takes courage to be open because you may receive something that's kind of hurtful, right? It, you're, you're exposing, it's, a, it's emotional exposure. So I, I simplify it by calling it openness. But vulnerability is openness to emotional exposure, essentially. Okay, so they're, they're similar, right? But they are distinctly different. So, you know, if you're a humble person, you're, you're, you're actually a person of, of great strength, as we talked about with deference and gratitude, you're a person of great strength because you're comfortable with yourself enough to know, Hey, let me listen to what this person has to say. It doesn't mean you're going to agree with it. It doesn't mean you have to do with it, but you're open to what they're going to say. And you actually consider, you consider, you, you, you think about what they're saying. You know, that's, that's humility and vulnerability is, well, um, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to go out on this limb or take this edge, uh, you know, go to the edge here and I may fall over. Right. But I'm not going to let that stop me from, well, expressing what I need to express or daring to do something that I believe is right. That's vulnerability. Okay. Because you, what it is, is you're not, you're not vulnerability is the opposite of protecting yourself. You guys tell me, I mean, don't let me say all the, you guys tell me, don't you see that in the world? People generally operate in a protective bubble. You know, they do stuff, but boy, they, they, right. People will say, well, if I do that, well, what happens if this happened and they want all this protection? Well, that's the opposite of vulnerability. Vulnerability is I'm going to do this because this is the right thing. And then uh, Benjamin Hardy, psychologist said, do the right thing. Always do the right thing and let the consequences follow. I love that quote for me. I love that quote because that means sometimes you're going to do the right thing and guess what? It isn't going to be a party and you're not going to be the greatest person that ever lived, right? You're actually going to maybe suffer for it a little bit. But in the end, what is it about? It's about your internal character. So a uh, great quote. Um, yeah. it, so when we were talking about vulnerability, uh, this is literally mid-August. Um, one of the lines that we had said was it's a strength in others, but a inadequacy in us. Could you uh, expand on that a little bit? 
Sure. This goes back to what I said before, and you're going to hear me say these things as we talk, you know, as we kind of hit on these qualities, I'm always going to say, well, it goes back to what we said before, right? And it goes back, and, and this goes back to what we said before. It's because it's a mindset. It, it's a mindset. So vulnerability, vulnerability means you're, vulnerability is, is real courage. Okay. Because what is it? The neuroscience shows that our minds act in what way it always wants to predict the outcome, right? It wants to know the outcome before you do something. And that's the opposite of vulnerability. Vulnerability is, is taking is, is the mindset of, of courageously taking an action that you cannot predict the outcome. from. And guess what? The outcome isn't, the outcome doesn't, um, you know, the outcome isn't, isn't what the, what drives whether or not you do that or not. See, we do a lot of things based on what the outcome is going to be. Vulnerability is not expressed based on the outcome because it doesn't, it doesn't do it for the outcome. It does it because it's a mindset of strength and courage. Yeah. When we were discussing vulnerability, I remember giving the illustration of being in my fifth grade classroom years ago yeah. and my teacher putting the either pet hamster or pet gerbil in the middle of the table and how it quickly ran to the edge of the desk in order to seek protection. And so like that simple animal, okay, this low level creature, we do the same thing. We tend to. But the difference is we have complicated relationships and we're so we're doing something that nature's put into us for our protection but unfortunately it has negative consequences when when it's applied then to our relationships could you speak to that a little bit how about how yes it's i guess natural to not want to be vulnerable okay it's in our dna as a species to defend ourselves you know the first law of nature is self-preservation but at the same time we have relationships that we want to maintain and sometimes we get hurt from them and we want to do something like you know get into our shell and hide and move away and resist and uh separate ourselves from the person who's hurt us um just how how does how do you reconcile that conflict of wanting to protect because of nature but then also what are you telling us we need to expose ourselves a little bit more and be vulnerable? It's, it's because, and I, and I touched on this a little bit in that, in that program, um, when it comes to vulnerability and I want to be frank, you may, you could expose, it is exposure. You could lose something. You could lose a relationship. You could lose your reputation. Imagine that. Um, so that is a possibility, but you know what else is also a possibility because of vulnerability to answer your question is what you can gain. Okay. What, what new relationship you may lose relationships, but what new relationships might you gain because of vulnerability? You might lose an aspect of your reputation, but what parts of your, of your self being and self worth may you grow and become even more powerful in because of vulnerability. So yes, frankly, you can be exposed to loss, Mac, but you also can be exposed to gain that you have not even imagined. And having said that, I do believe that uh, we also need to touch on other things that require humility and vulnerability, which is apology and then forgiveness. To me, they are like two different sides of a similar process. Some, when I hurt someone, I apologize. When someone hurts me, I am ready and open to forgive. And we were talking, and that was actually very, very important to me, and I, I also got positive feedback from other people. When we were talking about apology, you identify what it is, what we can apologize for and what qualities or what steps are needed for it to be sincere, for it to be accepted, for it to be real and bringing some sort of relief. Can you briefly touch on that too? 
Yeah, I, I really enjoyed that program on apology because, uh, you know, you want to talk about a word you hear all the time, right? You, I mean, we throw that word around everywhere. And I think we all, we all do this. We all think we know exactly what it is. I mean, we talked about it for 20 minutes, right? 20, 22 minutes. But after the end of that, and, and, and I prepared the material for that program and I still felt I grew. So there's things that, that I knew, but there was things that, that, that I had, that I had either forgotten or didn't know that we talked about during that program. So, you know, you take something so simple and so overused like apology and you, we think we know exactly what it is and, and we find out, well, maybe we don't really know as much as we think that we know. That's what I appreciated about that program. So, you know, yeah, apology. What, how do you, we all, again, I'm taking the look for the best in others approach here. I think we all want to apologize. I think we want to, and I think we want to do it the right way. I think, I think because there's a little bit of confusion about what it is and how to do it, it doesn't always come across the right way. And then people don't accept it. And then we get hurt and, and, and then things don't get better. And we say, but I apologized, right? So apology really kind of has to have a couple elements to it. And we talked about three. So if you're going to offer an apology, it needs to, you need to, well, and we'll put it in layman terms, own it. Okay. So you need, you need to own what it is that, that, that you apologize for. So if you do something and then you say, here's an example, you do something, you say, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that, John, or I'm sorry about that. You know, Wendy, um, probably not going to come across as you're owning it. Vastly different. If you say, John, I'm, when I said, this and this and this. I am, I'm apologizing for that. I, I shouldn't have said that. I was in the wrong. Wendy, when I did this specific thing, when I did this, when I took this and I didn't ask and I, I'm apologizing for it. So owning it has to do with saying you're sorry, but then here's the key, describing what it is you're sorry for. That's how you own it. The second key we talked about was, was basically about deflecting. I'm sorry, but... And then you go into all the, you know, I wouldn't have done that if you hadn't done, you know, that, that big no, no, big, big no, no. If you want your apology to be sincere. Okay. Whether it's accepted or not still, you know, a lot, you know, that kind of, you know, hangs on the other person, but they can't take away your sincerity if you're sincere, but you got to show sincerity by owning it, by not deflecting. And then by making amends, well, making amends is, is, you know, you can make amends by, by just making the apology, or you can give something in addition to make amends. So those are the three steps to, 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 to a sincere apology in, in laying the groundwork for somebody to possibly, you know, to, to, uh, amend the relationship. Let me make one more point about this. The, the best point out of that program I felt was understanding that apology needs to be, because sometimes people wonder why their apologies weren't accepted and, and they were very sincere. Okay. So it's not about, maybe sometimes it's not about the sincerity. It's about the, the apology needs to be commensurate with what the, you know, with what the, the issue was. Okay. And we talked about like a child sexual abuse victim. You don't just tell somebody you're sorry once, even twice, maybe even three times, even sincerely, and then expect that to cover it. I gave you the example of a, a real life example of a mother and a daughter. It took her three years to offer an apology in various ways, not just in spoken word, but in action and in many other things. So just remember that you can walk down the street, right? And bump into somebody and you say, you're sorry. Does that, does that suffice? Or do you need to get in your car and drive around and find that person again and roll down the window and say, Hey, Hey, you, I, I bumped into you and I, I'm just wanted to say, I'm sorry. Again. I mean, that's ridiculous. So the, the apology needs to be commensurate with what the, with what the, the, the issue or the offense was. And I think those were the key things out of the apology. Um, before you continue on to forgiveness, can you tell me why is it, it's so much easier to say sorry to a stranger than it is to someone that you you love because the stranger doesn't know you and you don't know them um and so there's no there's no attack on your personal character but when you know somebody or you have a family member or a friend that you need to that, that you have some sort of into some sort of level of intimacy with then, then apology becomes, uh, uh, and it becomes, it, apology becomes, can become in our minds a, you know, 
an acknowledgement of guilt, an acknowledgement of failure, an acknowledgement that I'm less than than what I think I am in my own world, right? In my own, we all have a worldview of ourselves. So somebody who doesn't know us and we just bump into the street and probably never going to see again, why is it so easy to say sorry to them? Because that's not that that does that has nothing to do with your character. But when you have the intimacy of a friendship or a spouse or a son, daughter, what or or, or a longtime friend. Now it becomes, an, a, now the, your character comes into, into view and that is what makes it difficult because our mind gets involved and we think we're, we're, we're putting ourselves down or we look less in front of somebody. But understanding this, going through a program like this, listening to our conversations and how we dissect this should help somebody to see that's not necessarily what it means. That's your mind and forgiveness, because this is like uh, this other thing, the ability in us to let things go, to move yeah. on, uh, becoming integral with ourselves and not living by uh, being hurt, not uh, standing by previous feelings of being offended, insulted, um, of uh, the feeling of harm that someone caused to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like as you as you introduce each quality, you guys, you know, it's it comes back, I'm getting key points that come back to my mind. And it tells me that, that those programs were really valuable. I mean, what we talked about was really valuable, because we're just pulling one point. And hopefully these points are are interesting enough for anybody who listens now or listens later to say, hey, well, that's interesting. Let me go back and check what else is there? What else don't I know? And how else might I be able to apply that? And that certainly applies here to forgiveness. So here's my main, this is the main thing that came to my mind about forgiveness. You already said it. You already said what we talked about in the program so well. So here's what I'm going to interject just for forgiveness. Is forgiveness about the other person or is it about you? See, that's, that's the question. See, most people, when they think about forgiveness, this includes me too. You think of forgiveness in the sense of, of forgiving somebody else, okay? But forgiveness, if somebody's offended you, your forgiveness is not about the other person. It's about you. It's, you forgiveness is about, it's about you letting go. So that's, that's what it is. It's, it's forgiveness. When you offer forgiveness, you're, you're, you're being kind to yourself. You're telling yourself, I'm going to let go of this thing and I'm not going to beat it into the ground. I'm not going to stand still here in time, right? Cause that's what, if you don't offer forgiveness, you're stuck in time. You're stuck way back whenever this thing happened that you're, you know, considering whether you should forgive or not, right? You're stuck there. So forgiveness is letting go and moving on. Do you do that for the other person? No, you really do that for yourself. And that's the key to forgiveness in addition to all the other things that, that you mentioned about it. Okay, so quality number seven is sincerity. Um, this one, I, I did some thinking about it, but I'll go ahead and let you uh, introduce it and then I'll come back. Now, what were you saying for me to introduce that, yes. uh, Matt? Yes. Okay, sincerity. Um, I love that quality. Um, I looked really looked forward to that to that program. What is sincerity? You know why? Another. It's, it's again. It's a word that we hear. It's a word that we use. You know, right? Do you guys ever hear of anybody say, "Well, that was sincere," or "Or that person's sincere," or? Oh, that person's not sincere. Do you do you ever hear anybody do that? Yeah. Or man, they're sincerely wrong. Or they, you know, yeah. the negative. <laughs> yeah. Right. So you can, or you can take the negative. Right. You. So we use the word. I, I wonder every time I hear the word, I wonder if we actually know what we're talking about when we when we say. So here's a here's a main point out of that program that I appreciated, is, um, you know, you can it is sincerity, truthfulness, right? We talked about that. Truthfulness is important. Truthfulness has to do with, you can, you can, you can go through a process, right? And you would know this as lawyers and as mediators, you can go through a process where you can determine if somebody's telling the truth based on what, based on factual evidence, right? You know, as a, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a process there by which you could possibly determine if somebody's telling the truth. How do you, how that is different than 
you cannot prove you can prove possibly prove somebody's telling the truth, but how do you prove somebody's being sincere? That was what I, that was the question I kind of postured in that, in that program. See, I don't think you can. So sincerity is this internal thing. It, it's a, it's our internal, you know, if we're being sincere, uh, yeah, there's truthfulness as a part of it, but that isn't, that doesn't really describe what sincerity is. And then I tied it into apology Remember we talked about that and I said, how does, you know, people want to apologize, but how do you, how do you apologize? Well, you need to be sincere. Okay. Okay, Brett, I got to be sincere. How do I be sincere? Well, you be, you, you can learn to be sincere if, if you are, you know, again, if you're, you can project sincerity if you're vulnerable. See how these all tie into each other. If you're, we talked about it. Well, if you're vulnerable, if you're, if you're open, you know, when you're apologizing, if you do these things, if you, if you project these things, then, then sincerity can come in there. But I think the key for really understanding sincerity is, is, um, and it just slipped my mind what, what, uh, what the quality was or what, what it was. I had it, I got all these things in my head and sometimes I can't get them all out. Uh, well, is it in any way connected to truthfulness again? Because that was always my struggle. And that is, is there a, and we had asked this question when we were going through it back in uh, September 5th, 2021, is there a danger in being sincere? Is it always a good thing to do? You know, I mean, if like people appreciate if you're sincere to them, OK, but but sometimes the question to me is. People might appreciate it if I'm being sincere to them, but is it in the natural best interest for me to be sincere to them, for me to tell them the absolute truth? Because that was a question that I wrestled with last time. Mm -hmm. Is there should you always be truthful in every situation? Uh I think the other day something came up where I don't know. There's a cheating spouse, and uh, they uh, stop the relationship. They go back to their um, their um, spouse, and the question is: Should they be honest and confess? Like is or should they just say, "Well, I made a mistake. I've learned from it. I'm not going to bring it up. I'm going to bury it and then move on." So, what do you think? Yeah, that is, that's that's it's well said. It's it's it, you know, it's difficult to answer in in a in a precise way. I I I know what you're saying there. Um, sincerity, you know, sincerity doesn't mean always being. Uh, you know, we talked about truthfulness. There's always saying the truth. I mean, do you say the truth in a blunt way because it's the truth? Um, you know, some people do, but you know, like when you're talking in the context of relationship building, either in a family, what if you're trying to do relationship building in a mediation and you're trying to get common ground? Okay. I have the truth. And so you slam somebody with the truth. Well, just ask yourself, how, how am I contributing to relationship building when I do that? I spoke the truth. <laughs> okay. You spoke the truth and you hit somebody over the head with it. I mean, are you laying the groundwork for settlement? Are you laying the groundwork for 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 uh, mutual agreement? Are you laying the groundwork for for building a stronger relationship with your son, your daughter, your your you know your spouse? Your are you laying with your worker, your boss? You know, just ask yourself that. So, so having the truth with you, having the evidence doesn't give you the right to clobber somebody over the head with it. So, you know, this is this is an aspect of sincerity. So, sincerity. Sincerity is about being real, right? It, it's it's about it's about being real, but it's not about doing things, um, you know, in an arrogant, blunt way. And I still, even talking all that, missed the one thing <laughs> I meant to say. So maybe it'll come back to yeah, you later, and I'll but, say, "Hey, okay. remember on that," and then I'll I'll say it again. But anyway, after the program, I did uh, some consideration to that, and my other thought about it was that truthfulness is being true about your words so it's it's subject to verification so you can check if something was true or untrue mm -hmm. sincerity is being true with your emotions mm -hmm. this is why you can't object you can't objectively verify it with anything because emotion has no mm -hmm. standard actually 
it is something that you feel inside and it is about being sincere into that, which then gives me the way to introduce kindness, which again, kindness is something that you have inside you and you want to be sincere to someone as opposed to good manners, mm -hmm. which are just externally taught um, ways how you should operate within society not to hurt other people. Right. Right. That's good. I, it reminded me of that class illustration, like if somebody's misbehaving, if it's a child, it could be a, a, could, adults misbehave too. But generally, what are they told, right? Well, be nice. They're not generally told, well, be kind. Not generally. Because being nice, like you said, Natalie, so well, really goes more to um, behavior, right? Whereas kindness, we go back to mindset. See, it's mindset is always elevated over behavior. Mindset is the elevate, you know, behavior... You know, behavior, in my mind, mindset is it always is supersedes behavior. So that's why kindness supersedes being nice. Because you can be nice and still have other motives. You can be nice and want something in return. Generally, when you're being kind, it's it's applied in a setting where you've done something that wasn't deserved or or may have been needed or may have not been needed. It wasn't, it's not. It's not controlled by those. It's just was done because it was a good thing to do. It was, it was, it was, it was the right thing to do. It was a good thing to do. And it, it's not dependent upon return or payback generally. So that's kind of the difference between being kind and being nice. Okay. Um, did you want to say anything else about kindness before we move on to integrity? I did not know it. Okay. It's, it's really well said in that program. I just encourage everybody to go back to the program and watch it. Okay. Integrity then. Number in, nine. Yeah. Integrity. Um, you know, so these are the, this, this is, we just talked about that. Y you tell me how important integrity is in society. I mean, tell me how important integrity is in your relationships. Is it important to you? I mean, I'm asking you sincerely, right? No. Thank you. Absolutely. I think, you know, I think the definition for integrity was doing the right thing consistently. Yeah. Right. See, yeah. I was listening. And, <laughs> and I'm not Thank reading you. that. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, also, I think the f concept of it's almost like sincerity in a way where you have to be true to yourself. Yeah. Um, you're not doing something fake or flippant or just out of the blue or just for opportunity, you are doing it because it's the right thing to do. Uh, mm -hmm. To quote, to connect it to that phrase, that quote you gave earlier. And so it's very important because I want you know, somebody, if I'm in a relationship with them, that they have integrity so that I know I can trust them, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. integrity builds trust and mm -hmm. it puts into me a sort of comfort that I know, well, they're going to be consistent. They're not going to stab me in the back one day because that's what they've done to everybody else. Mm. They're not going to bad talk behind my back because they know that it's not right to do that. They're going to live by commandments that they value as being models and standards that they need to operate by. We all want that. The problem, of course, is we don't do it ourselves. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. integrity uh so selfishness really is one of the opposites of integrity so you know you look at your relationships and you can say is, is this a selfish relationship or is this a relationship of integrity if it's a relationship of integrity it has elements there trust is one here you know in in when we talk about all these qualities and we talk about the application and we make all these things let's let's be clear none of us practice these perfectly that the whole point of this is to be a little bit more aware cognitively of what this word is and, and a little bit deeper understanding of these words and then when you're in a when you're in the workplace or you're in some kind of you know thing with your with your family member like i was yesterday i have to think about these qualities and and generally they come back to my mind because we're talking about them on a weekly basis and i was able to um, and, and yeah, this week I can, I can go back to a, to something that happened, you know, two weeks ago w between me and another family member. So I've had two different instances in the last two weeks where I was like, this is what, how I feel, but if I do this, it's going to be this. And didn't I just talk about this? 
So if, you know, nobody knows, right? Nobody's watching, but am I going to be a person of integrity and make application of the things that I'm talking about or try to, or am I going to just, you know, because this is just something we talk. No. So, you know, I, I, I had to say, no, if I'm a person of integrity, I'm going to apply what I'm going to apply deference here, or, or, or I'm going to apply apology here, you know, and then, and then I have to make sure that I do it sincerely. And then I thought about, Hey, if I say, I'm sorry on this, even though it was difficult. And even though there's probably even more fault on the other person's side, I, I can't even go there. I have to show I'm sorry for saying this. Um, you know, and I, and I will commit to, to trying my best to not do that. So, you know, I'm talking about these qualities, but I also want you to know, that, I mean, we, we, we struggle with them and hopefully you're like me and, and if something comes up, you remember it. And if, if that, those same situations that I just told you, I mean, you can probably think of ones in your own life. If, if those had come up three months ago or six months ago, would you have handled them the same way? I can't answer for you, but I can answer for me. I, I handled some things in the last couple of weeks differently because of what we've been doing here. I made application of, of some of these qualities because we had been talking about them and because I can't live with, you know, I can't be a hypocrite and live with my conscience that way. If that, so yeah, they've affected me. I hope they affect you. I hope they affect uh, others who, who watch them and don't put a bunch of pressure on yourself that you have to know all these qualities. It's just, they'll come to mind when you're in the moment and you'll know it because you've considered them. And I didn't mean to get off on, on that, but that's, you know, for me, that's what integrity is. That's why I wanted to show you know, has, here's how I look at integrity. The stuff I'm talking about, I have to apply when nobody's looking. That's integrity. Yes. And let me close out these 10. Um, and then we're going to segue to Natalia introducing some questions that you've received. But when you say doing the, that the right thing when nobody's looking, that's the issue, right? Uh, the word hypocrisy comes to my mind because every one of us expects others to treat us right, to do the... To, to, to have all these same qualities. And when we don't get it, especially in our relationships, we feel a sense of injustice. Like, why was this done to me? Well, I have a justification as to why I can get angry and mad because I got hurt because a person doesn't forgive me. The person doesn't apologize. The person is not humble. And so it's really, really on us to then, you know, flip the switch and be like, look, I got to be consistent here. We're all human. None of us is going, are going to be able to live by these standards perfectly. But the, the first step is actually acknowledging that you have to try, right? That you need to do it. And I guess that's a good segue to authenticity because we all need to be genuine in, especially in doing these things, not being fake and haphazard. You know, going one step forward, two steps back, expecting it from other people, but not doing it ourselves. So can you lead us through authenticity and the, 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 the 10th and final quality that we just finished last week? Yeah, I like that. I like that we ended with authenticity because, uh, again, I'm always generally applying it to society in general. I mean, when you look at society in general, how authentic is society in this digital age of Instagram pictures and memes and uh, filters, right? Those are all words you hear every day. Oh, well, there's a filter on that. You know, it's like our, the, the language, the language of, I mean, that there's, you know, I'm sure they use the word, you know, filter in Polish for everybody who's doing, you know, in the, they have the word filter in, in, in the African language. So there's, hear these words introduced into society. And what does that word mean? You know, filter is to alter the image, right? To make it more, uh, I guess, appealing or more, right? I, I mean, you can, so and, I'm just. And filter and Polish is filtry. Just FYI. Okay. So, so, you know, there you go. Lots of people <laughs> use the word filtry in Poland, in Warsaw. I know they do. Just teasing you now. Really. Okay. So, um, you know, we live in a world, you guys, and that's just an example. That's just a, off the top of my head, okay, example. And it's not saying Instagram is evil and for all the people who are ready to send me messages, you're a bad, you know, Instagram is wonderful. You know, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is we live in an age that makes it really hard and you tell me what you think. It makes it really hard to be authentic because there's so much stuff out there that is twisting what is real. 
It's, it's reshaping what is real, right? Oh, you Photoshop that. Oh, you know, I'm not just making it about digital stuff. It's, but what I'm, I'm using that as an illustration that people change things from what the reality is. And that's the opposite of authenticity. Authenticity is, you know, are you an authentic person? When you say somebody's an authentic person, what are you saying? You're saying what you see is what you get. Okay. They're not hiding behind a veneer or an exterior. They're not projecting. See, authenticity is not projecting. Do you go, do, do you have any experience with people projecting? Okay. We'll go to, you know, when's the last time you spent time in a courtroom and listen, listen to opposing counsels talk about things or people talk about it. You know, everybody's projecting and posturing and that's not, that's not authentic. That's working an agenda. So authenticity is, is it's about being the real thing and being okay. It's about being okay with being the real thing. That's authenticity. And after we've done all 10 qualities and throughout the process, we've been um, doing a survey um, among our friends, but also on Facebook, back to social media, um, to check what, uh, which one of those qualities might be the most important to people which is the one that can shape the relationship best. And of course, the responses varied, but some people did ask us specific questions. And I would like to start with the first one, which was, if I am the only one in my relationship who is trying to apply these qualities, as good as they are, if the relationship is just one-sided, what should I do? Yeah. That's such a good question, isn't it? I mean, and when you think about that, you think that you think that that question is unique to that individual, that that is probably applicable almost across the board. Universal. I, yeah, I'm applying it. But if the other person, I mean, this is great, Brett. Okay, great. Kindness and good. And, and I get it, you know, but if the other person isn't, you, you hear the frustration come in, I mean, you can probably read into that. If the other person is implying it, then, you know, they're throwing their hands up. And they're saying, then what good are these qualities? That's, that's kind of how I see that. And that's maybe not how the person exactly intended it. But that I, I have, you know, I hear that. I hear it in that tone uh, often when people are asking the question. So here's what here, here would be my response to, to that. And again, this goes back to family reconcile and what we do in family reconcile. And you can, we try to, we try to say it in word. And then we try to, to also, um, you know, reinforce it. Most people come to family reconcile or deal with mediators or, or try to get help with relationships because they're trying to, they're trying to affect, you know, a change is essentially what they're trying to do. And they're often thinking about the other party or parties involved. What I try to help people to see and this is a major facet or function of, of family reconcile is that it actually starts with you. And I've said this before, it starts with you. So this may sound crude or harsh, and I don't mean it in, in this exact way because I'm trying to be sincere, right, Mac? And then sincere is being truthfulness, but does it mean always being blunt? Well, maybe sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. So here's one of those areas where this might apply to what I'm going to say right now. It does not matter what the other person does or think. What, what they do or what they think, you know, does that sound harsh? Because we're talking about trying to affect relationships. I, I hope it isn't overly harsh because it's absolutely sincere. What matters most is what, how these qualities apply to you. How are you benefiting from it? So if you apply kindness because you're trying to affect an, uh, an external relationship and that external relationship is not affected in a positive way, does that mean kindness wasn't worth learning about? Does that mean kindness wasn't worth being understanding it more? Does that mean kindness has not affected you in a positive way? Okay, so maybe it didn't affect the person you 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 most wanted to affect. But many of you maybe you go out in the world and you go to the store and you do something kind to somebody at the store. How do you know you don't affect them in a tremendous way? So we have responsibilities not just to our intimate relationships, but we have responsibilities to society to counter to counter that attitude we were talking about in the beginning of the show and why we did all this. We have a responsibility to counter that if this resonates with you. So, you know, that, that's how I would, I would answer, answer that. And, and again, we can go into more detail. And again, that's why family reconcile exists. When we work with somebody like that, who's, who's struggling with applying these qualities because they don't see a return from the other person, that's okay. 
it, it's okay. We have to help them to see that this isn't a failure. It's not a failure on your part. You still have you. You're still benefiting. Now, there are other things we can do to work along with this person. Maybe we can reach them in other ways. That's family reconciled. That, that's what we do. That's, that's, that's our intuition and our expertise. So in, you know, in short terms, without getting too deep, that's, that's how I would answer that question. It's okay. You're still getting great benefit yourself. Let's see what else we can do to help you in possibly reaching this other individual. And, and then, I, I, before we move on to the next question, I would also ask one, also, I guess, contribute one thing. And that is, <clears throat> in any relationship, whether it's a uh, parent, child, uh, you know, two lovers, um, you know, siblings, there's always going to be two sides, right? Where one might be doing more than the other. But let's say a relationship is unable, especially between, you know, um, two people who are romantically involved. Let's say the relationship is not able to be sustained because even the one person doing their best effort, the other one just does not try hard enough um, for whatever reason, or they're not forgiving enough, or they just can't let go of certain pains and the relationship just kind of fizzles and maybe they leave. If and when the person who was learning these things and trying these things ever gets involved in a new relationship, in, in a different relationship, then having them having tried these 10 are is going to then set them up to be able to look in the mirror and see where their faults lie. Because I've always said it takes two people to make a relationship work, right? And a lot of times a relationship becomes destructive, it ends. And then the parties move on and they point the finger only at the other side and think the reason that relationship failed was because of them, not because of anything I did. But I think this is the value, even if the relationship was to end because you were trying this sincerely and the other person was not in your next relationship, you will then have prepared yourself to not have a relationship that's going to be so easy to fail because you're going to have taken the blinders off a little bit for yourself. You'll know where your faults lie. And then it also might also help you pick a better mate, uh, in mm. my opinion, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you know what to look for as well. All right. If this guy has no integrity, uh, don't be surprised. He stabs you in the back. Right. So anyway, that, that's just what I was thinking when you were uh, talking about this struggle, this conflict the person might feel like, well, I'm trying here, but they're not. There's only value and benefit to come from it. That was, yeah. Thank you for saying that. I, I couldn't have said it any better than what you just said. That was a nice synopsis of, of exactly what, uh, of the, of the value that's there. The value is not dependent upon other people. The value is dependent upon your, your understanding and application of it to yourself. So the next question actually comes within, I uh, actually stems from what we've been discussing and it is, I keep trying to get my husband of 35 years to communicate, but he just doesn't open up, which causes us to argue a lot out of frustration. It's causing strain and anxiety on me, and I don't know what to do. One day I want to try to help him, and the next day I want to just end it and move on. And this kind of up and down emotion causes me great distress. What should I do? Yeah, all these questions, you see how all these questions end, what should I do? I mean, what is that? You know, so you got this all, you got all this emotion and, and this confusion and, and essentially what are people looking for? You know, what, what are they looking They're looking for, for, for relief. What should I do? You know, because they've tried stuff or, or, or maybe they haven't tried anything because they don't know what to try. So you see how critical this is that, that, that we can, that we carry on with what we're doing because people are looking for answers. They're looking for solutions. They're looking for a path. Yeah. They may not even be looking for an end result or a solution. Maybe they're just looking for the right path, you know? So that, that's the value of what we're doing here. So what should, what should she do? So now you're into some, you know, serious stuff, but if somebody isn't communicating and that's kind of how they've been since the beginning and you were okay with it then, but 35 years into it, you're not so okay with it, right? That could be a, that could be something that's there. If somebody isn't open, if they're not a communicator, it doesn't generally 
that doesn't generally happen over overnight or, or happen because of the relationship. That's probably who the person was before you were with them, before she married him. He probably was that type of person before. And maybe at the time it didn't bother her, or maybe she overlooked it, whatever the case may be. But now the relationship has grown, right? Yeah, and we'll continue on. Brett should be back in about five seconds. But this is important, an important topic, Natalia, because it's something that we deal with all the time in our cases as family law attorneys. We see this situation come up plenty of times, right, where two people fall out of love, quote unquote, and then they find themselves in divorce court because they just don't see a path forward. But hopefully uh, Brett can continue on. Pick up what you were saying. Yeah. So, you know, and, and so that, you know, that. Again, that's the point is, is, is they're looking for, a, you know, some gen, people are generally looking for a path forward on stuff that doesn't have a, that isn't clear to them. So if it took 35 years for, for the situation to get to where it is now, you can, you, I'm not saying it's going to take 35 years to undo it. But what I'm saying is if you got 35 years into a pattern of behavior, you're not going to change that pattern overnight. That's simply, that. that's kind of what I'm getting at. It's going to take some time. It's going to take some effort. And I've talked about this in those other programs with, with you. It's what do you want? So it comes down to what you want. So I'd ask her, what do you want? You know, because she says I'm up and down and I don't like, okay, I understand. What do you want? We can kind of help you with that again. Family Reconcile can help. You know, we can help if they came to you or to, to Natalia. With this situation, we can help you try to figure out what you want. And once you know what you want, then how committed are you? Okay, because what you being wanting something and committing to something are two different things. So I, I try to help them and un, help her understand what she wants, what she's committed to. Okay, I'm I want this. I would like this, and I and I'm I'm committed to it, and I'm willing to work on it. Okay, if I can get you, if I can get them there, help to get them there, then then this is now we have to start thinking about this. You know, um, and I've had this come up with with other parties is that we we set out on some things that we're trying to explore with them or I'm trying to mentor them, help them. You know, I'm walking along with them saying, did you try this? And maybe let's try that. And if the result doesn't immediately come, generally people are like, well, what are we going to do? What you know, they what are we going to do? And well, see, this isn't working. And, right, and then that comes in and then I have to say, no, 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 no. How do we know it's not working? Okay. So it didn't work in this instance, or you didn't get what you wanted, but we have to give this time. You're talking about 35 years of a marriage. You're talking about patterns that have been long set. We can, we can affect those patterns. We can change them to a degree, but it's going to take time. So that's why I ask people, what do you want? And what are you committed to? If I can get a want and a commitment in that direction, then there are things that we can do with it. Now I have to start helping people be patient. There's another quality we didn't talk about that we can talk about, you know, at a later time, but patience comes in. So I would have to help her once she knows, once she knows what she wants and commits to, to, to be patient. And then we can start trying things to reach and help somebody um, perhaps become even slightly more open and, and slightly more communicative. And that comes with the, you know, certain tools that, that we have and can, can, can use. So if you're in that situation, if you're in that position, you know, reach out to us, any of us, any of the three of us, and we will help somebody along that, along that line. And just one thing I'd like to add on that, because I saw this question when it, you know, came through to you. Um, and I was thinking about it because I've had, I know I've had a case in the last 12 years in my, you know, law office um, where somebody was basically throwing in the towel because they felt like the marriage was dead, Right. So what this sounds like to me is you know, the classic um, wife or a woman feels man doesn't talk because men sometimes we close down and we don't express ourselves as uh, easily or verbally as women, right? And uh, it is just me from the male perspective, um, because I've just seen this conflict play out so many times. And uh, there was a book out there written years ago called Love and Respect. And it's a book whose premise basically is without love, women react without respect. And then without being respected, the man reacts without love. 
and uh, they call it the crazy cycle, right? It's a vicious cycle that couples find themselves in. And one of the things that discusses is the solution for this is who's going to get off this roller coaster wheel first? Who's going to be the bigger adult? Who's going mm -hmm. to? So in, in other words, um, if it's if it's the woman, she should try to show him more respect because that should energize his love for her. Mm -hmm. And it should. And if it's the man who's feeling this way, then he should show her more love because that should energize her respect towards him. And if a man feels respected and honored, he's going to want to show love. And if a woman feels love, she's going to want to show respect. And then you get on this positive, energizing cycle. So anyway, I encourage folks to get that book because it I read it years ago and it made an impact on me. <laughs> and I've shared it with many different clients over the years, you know, who are contemplating divorce. They're not going through a divorce yet, but they're <laughs> thinking about it. And they I'm not a marriage counselor. You know, definitely I've had my own struggles, you know, but that book made a lot of rational sense. You know, when we get ourselves into these loops and we can't get off. And so it sounds like to me, after 35 years, the person's been stuck in a rut race, right? It, they've been stuck in this loop where he closes down and he might have his reasons or he can't explain them. But then she reacts a certain way and then he reacts because of her reaction and then it goes on and on and on and on. So I say get off the cycle and, um, and it's going to be requiring some humility from her, vulnerability from her, apologizing from her. You know, forgiveness by her. It, it, but that's supposed to then energize him to then want to show the love that she's desperately looking for. That's right. That's well said. And even if she does all of that and she doesn't get the, well, then she has to entertain other, you know, other options, other other things to do. And, and again, that's that's what we do. See, that's why it's not. That, that's why, to me, uh, you know, what we're doing in, in the Compassion Project and why Family Reconcile is so important because it's not just an overnight thing and it's not just a, hey, go do this. Or, or you know, it's not this directive thing. That's why the mentoring model is so unique and important when it comes to helping others is because when you have somebody working alongside you, somebody right down there in the trenches with you, not as a director, but as a collaborator, Somebody's, you know, it's not, Hey, pick this up and go over there. And this is what's going to happen. It's, Hey, let's pick this up together. Let's try and go over there and let's see what happens with that. And you have somebody working alongside you. There is a support as a balance, you know, it, it, uh, it, I mean, the research shows the statistics show the success, su success rate for whatever it is we're reaching, reaching out for dramatically increases when we have somebody working alongside of us, supporting us, right? Think of the new, think of the resolutions people do at the beginning of the year. They, they set out on it, right? And then a week ended or two weeks, three, you know, generally by two months, kind of those resolutions kind of fade in the back. And it's because it's because people wanted it, but they weren't committed to it. And, and so they kind of revert back into patterns that are unhealthful that got them in that position in the first place. Imagine those same individuals if they had somebody working alongside of them, somebody working with them for a sustained period of time. Imagine how the results would differ. Well, according to the research, they would, they would, they would, they would successfully differ dramatically. So that's, what, that's why we do, the three of us do what we do. And that brings us again to the third question. Uh, which is um, very common in my practice, I guess, in Max's practice as well. And it can be both um, applicable for the adults as well as adults with children. And this is what happens when we are disconnected, when we are making attempts and all fails. The question actually is phrased the way I have been disconnected from my daughter for the past five years and all the attempts I'm doing are futile. What am I doing wrong? What can I do to improve the relationship? Yeah, that's, I mean, you, you can hear the heartbreak, right? You can read into the, you can read into the heartbreak. I mean, a, a mother estranged from her daughter. Is it unique? No. It, it's it's actually quite common, you know, across across the, the the earth. So, you know, the first thing I would do is gently correct her on the on the on the point. I, I would start here. This is what I would do. Um, she mentioned it was futile in the question, and so what she's looking at is she's looking at her. What she's saying is I've made these attempts, repeated attempts, whatever they are, and they haven't elicited you know, any response from her. So they were futile. And what I would do is I would correct her gently on that. I'd say, no, no, that wasn't futile. 
No, that was, that was, that was tremendous. And hopefully they'd be like, what are you talking about? And then I would say, well, you know, look at it from this perspective. You, you know, you sent however many correspondents, whether by text, email, whatever it is that you did. Okay. And you got no response. I understand that. But you still conveyed a message. You conveyed a message, whether they responded or not, you conveyed the message that you care, that you love them, that the relationship matters to you. See, it doesn't matter that you didn't get a response. You conveyed that, whether they responded or not. So imagine this. Imagine something happens, time and unforeseen occurrence, you know, befall us all. We end up on a hospital bed and we don't know, you know, if we're going to make it out. Imagine if you had made those attempts, maybe they weren't reciprocated, but you're laying there knowing that you may not see this child again. You may not even make it out of the hospital, but you did everything that you could do. You tried what you could do and you conveyed your love and your interest in that, in that relationship. So if something did happen to you on that hospital bed and you didn't leave that hospital, I think that, that you would do so. You, you, there would be a peace that you would be able to have with yourself that you would not have if you just never did anything and never, you know, and then just gave up and said, well, no. so my whole point is, is I would try to build out, I look for words like that and in their, in their, in their, cause it tells me what they're thinking. And I would try to correct gently. No, you've done something wonderful by reaching out whether they've responded or not. That's where I would start. And then I would build on that with her say, well, you know, what, what have you done? And then, okay, well, maybe there's some other things we can do. Maybe, maybe we can do it for you. You know, maybe, maybe hearing from a third party, you know, sometimes we can say things we want to say them. We have the courage to say them, but they actually need to come from somebody else. Again, that's where family reconcile comes in. And that's why we, we, we allow you to do it yourself if you want, but sometimes things need to come from somebody else. And then that's when we can get involved. So we're trying to cover all those angles in those areas. And again, it takes time, but don't, don't use a word like futile because it's anything but futile. Yeah. The only thing I would add to that is basically, um, resupport what you just said about futility. You know, both these last two questions, the one with 35 years of trying to come to, to have and communicate and this one of trying to last five years. Um, you know, there's a building in Houston somewhere. I remember years ago with, a, with, with somebody graffiti on it and painted the words, no lie lives forever. It, and I've always remembered those words mm -hmm. because it's true. I think anything that you do that you, where you keep trying and trying and trying, eventually there's going to be something that's happened that happens that's going to cause the other person to think about it, hmm. to, uh, to, to realize, to, to appreciate what you had done. Okay. You'll never know if you give up and you stop chasing the relationship, stop pursuing, you'll never know how years later, when that something happens that intervenes, that, that causes the recipient to then, you know, think, you know, and, and reconsider things. You never know if you stop too soon. Mm -hmm. and so I guess the example I'm saying is I, I had a situation where I was negotiating with my opposing counsel to have um, a mom allow my client, a, a grandma, to see um, the, young ch the young children, mm -hmm. okay? uh, the, her grandkids. But mom was completely closed. And there were past hurts, past pains from situations that had happened but she was not willing to bend, okay? Eventually, something happened that intervened into their lives in a very big way. But I was thankful that all the attempts we had done to try to, you know, reach out and to make amends and to make peace, by the time this intervention happened, it actually set the ground stage. I guess grandma never realized it, but to me, I saw it. It set the ground stage so now mom could look back and see, okay, I'm glad that she had been consistent and persistent in chasing me because I can, I'm ready now to, you know, to, to make amends. But what if grandma never pursued it? And what if she felt it was futile and it wasn't worth the effort? Like, look, I've been trying and trying and trying. And so that's why I'm saying no lie is forever. Eventually something's going to happen 
unfortunately, that's something might be the death of a loved one mm-hmm. or your own funeral, and that's the intervention. Well, unfortunately, it might be a hospital visit. You know, people have these, you know, like Shakespearean tra- tra- tragedy based, you know, mm-hmm. like come up into that, that causes people to get real. Maybe that's where it's going to be. I don't know. But um, it, it might be something that you never could imagine. And so I say be persistent and consistent until that big thing happens because it's going to happen. It always does. That's right. And- Mm-hmm. Brett, I'm sorry. Again, from my practice, I um, know that even more difficult and even more painful it is where you have the sort of parental alienation. So you do have a small kid, um, a, a child that you devoted a part of your life to, then you are separated by the um, breakup in the family. And um, you try so hard you do everything that you uh that you are being told to do and um you try for years that causes bitterness in you because you think that what you are doing might have been in vain but actually i really had a very heartwarming example in my own practice i was representing a woman in a very difficult divorce case and a part of the divorce case was um the husband manipulating the daughter Hmm. the daughter was um acting very weirdly against her mom and um very i mean she was even hostile this is what i would say years have passed of the attempts of this lady um step by step it was to me getting better but then something absolutely um, incredible happened. This girl, now an adult, fell in love. And Mm. the guy that she fell in love with was born in the family that that was sticking very much together. Then this girl looked at this family model that she finally found herself in, and she started tracing back that her family broke up at a certain stage, but there are things that she herself, being an adult now, can do to trace it back and to find the mom. And this is what she did. She reached out to the mom. She brought her to this new family of her boyfriend. And they really um, rebuilt, reconstructed this entire relationship. It took years. Hmm. But fortunately, uh, there might be positive ways and positive outcomes outcomes of people who really see good examples so again the way we should be practicing those um virtues those fantastic 10 qualities is that sometimes we can be this good examples to uh, to do this good example to others even if we just try even if we fail and we can motivate those people to change their own lives yeah, so well said. That's really well said. And so I'm just going to conclude with these. These are my two points to this, to, to what we're talking about. That's why I ask people not just what they want, but once they tell me what they want or we help them to understand what they want, then how committed are you to that? Because you're not going to get what you want unless you commit to it. Just wanting isn't enough. You have to commit. Well, how do you commit? Well, there are a number of ways you can commit, but that's why that's why having a support system is so valuable. Okay. You can only do so much by reading a self-help book, right? We, I mean, the go to the go to Barnes and whatever the bookstore is, you know, or go to Amazon online. You got thousands of self-help books, right? So you get it, you read it, and the information's good, but you're left alone with that. And often people get information, but they're like, "How do I apply it?" Right? When you have someone like you, you know, Natalia, or you, Mac, or or, or, or family reconcile, working along with somebody working along with individuals trying to achieve an outcome that they want and that they are committed to is vastly different than just saying, well, I'm going to try this. Right. And so that's what we're offering here. That's really what we, what we want. And we're offering, okay, here's the qualities and here's how, here's how we can apply them to be better people individually. And now here's some things that we can also do that we're not discussing here. There are some things that we can do with individuals to help them reach these goals and if they can't reach the, the, the end goal of restoring or reconnecting a relationship, well, then they can still affect their own relationship with themselves, which is more important. And then as Mac mentioned so, so well, now going forward, not only do you, do, are you more aware of, of your own self, right? Self-awareness, but now you know what to look for in others going forward. So it helps with what you're building. Whether you can reconnect or not does not affect what you build. 
going forward. Those are two separate things. So that's really why we discuss this. That's what this is all about. If it resonates with people, you know, then, 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 and you want to know more or you want help or you want, you want the kind of help that we're talking about, then reach out to us. That's what we're here for. Last but not least, I'm, I'm, and what if, um, we operate on different emotional levels. Someone is already aware of those qualities and applies them in life. And we are facing a coworker, uh, a member of the family, a, a closed one, who is actually a closed one. Meaning, it, what if someone is emotionally closed? If someone is disconnected from their emotions. How to approach them? How to show value in emotions? to people who actually don't value them and prefer other qualities in life. Okay. So that's a loaded question. Um, I think it, it, it hovers around some of what we've already talked about, which is knowing what you want, committing to that, and then trying to apply these things. And then you're saying, okay, well, the person's closed off. So I, I benefit from them. I like them. I'm applying them, but I'm still not getting anything here. Um, if that's the case and, and you're working with someone like us or, or yourselves and you're working in, in, in some time has gone by. Okay. Well then, then maybe we need to start looking at some, some other things. Okay. Is there, you know, pattern always, you know, behavior follows a pattern. So, um, you know, can you count on this person? That's a question I would ask if, they don't open up. That's a specific thing that needs to be identified. They don't open up. Can you count on them? Um, is it always all about them? You know, if those are the things and you're working on those and those things don't change, well, then you have to start asking yourself why you're trying to maintain that relationship. And that may be a hard, you know, we all have sunk cost syndrome, right? Especially if the relationship's gone on for years. And, you know, but we have to ask ourselves, why am I trying to maintain, if they're not opening up, if they're, if they're continuing in a pattern, if it's always all about them and, and you're doing all the things that we're talking about and working along with somebody and you just can't make any headway, well, then you have to start asking that question. Why am I trying to maintain the relationship? And actually, should I be trying to maintain the relationship? All right, so we're now in the process of closing down. We've been at this for about an hour and a half. <clears throat> and I got to say, uh, Brett, this is our longest uh, live session we've ever done. So uh, thank <laughs> you because the information is so valuable and it's so good. And so I guess to close out, we can all make you know our points and our takeaways from the last 10 weeks. And uh, my takeaway would be this. Um, nobody is perfect, but... And, and, you know, I'm, I, I always get a little irritated whenever I hear people use that uh, standard because we all know that. <laughs> OK, but I think I have to say it because these 10 uh, qualities, it's OK if you have not been doing them all. It's OK if you didn't know even how to do them all. Like the example Natalia gave a few minutes ago of the girlfriend who goes and discovers, oh, that's what a normal family looks like. Like mm -hmm. most of us aren't even trained with all of this from the very beginning. We, a lot of us come from dysfunction. And so we don't, we don't have it modeled for us. So it's okay if you haven't done it, but now there's a new opportunity that presents itself. We can change and make the affirmative active steps to do things right so that we can have the best relationships possible. Forgiveness is on the table so that we can fix relationships that have been bruised and hurt in the past. Okay, apology is on the table so that now we can repair the damaged unions that we've had. And so I say folks should take these 10, not with a bunch of regret, but with new opportunities to move forward and actually do better. Because, you know, tomorrow is a better day and I'm a realist, but, you know, the, our talk has made me more of an optimist, uh, uh, you know, when it comes to relationships, because they can be salvaged. This is why the topic is called reconnecting with family, 
right? And uh, anyway, that's my takeaway. And I just encourage everyone, even if you think, you know what, this isn't for you, you, you got it, keep trying because we never know how our relationships might be challenged in the future. Yes. And then if I am to say something out of those 10 things, uh, of course, me, myself, I was thinking that I am so much aware of the emotions and how they work and I am already grateful and I show humility. And of course, me saying that shows how much I like the, like those qualities. And uh, fortunately, I'm humble enough to admit that. But I do believe that um, the change begins in ourselves. And the change is us working on us, not us working on other people. Mm. And throughout these programs that we've been doing, I could see how not only those qualities are intersecting, but also how uh, us doing something unexpected, something that is not uh, desired or expected by the society, can change the entire situation, entire setup we are in. Make us look um, differently, but also make us look at a different perspective of the, at the things that we thought are stable and they are not going to move forward. Hmm. But sometimes it is you who bends. Sometimes it is you who shows vulnerability. And then people, out of surprise, they just um, step out of the roles they were following, of the patterns they were following. That might open them to be more authentic, that might um, make them more integral in what they are doing. But most of all, all of that begins with appreciation. Appreciation of those qualities, appreciating of the person that you are trying to apply it with, and appreciating of time you spend together, even if there is so little of this time. When we are talking of reconnecting, is talking about time, hmm. having the time, gaining this time and then miracles can happen yeah nicely said i'll, I'll just I appreciate your comments both of you i'll just end with this i'm going to circle back to the beginning society tries to tell in subtle ways tries to tell people these qualities are weakness and we're stepping up and saying not only are these qualities not weakness they're profound stabilizers of not only are they stabilizers they, they are profound qualities of strength so that that's the point here do not let society tell you these are weaknesses and you shouldn't even address them because you're going to get walked on or stepped on or or you're not going to benefit see that's a lie that's a lie these are qualities of strength that we if we recognize that and we apply them to ourselves, then guess what? We're going to be the best version of ourselves that we can be. And who doesn't get up in the morning really trying to be the best they can be or want to be the best they can be? They just don't know how. They need to be shown the way. They need some other information to consider. That's what we're doing here. We're saying, don't believe this lie. Here's the truth. And this is going to help you be the best version of yourself. And if you're the best version of yourself that you can be, well, imagine the impact you're going to have on those around you and on your relationships. Thank you. And uh, we will end with uh, screen sharing one more time, familyreconcile.com. And uh, I appreciate you so much, Fred, for sticking with us through these last couple months uh, because it's we've learned a lot. I know I have. So uh, for everyone listening, thank you. Appreciate your time. And... Uh, Come back because we got a lot more to go through with bread. And uh, this is not the end. This is just the beginning. All right. Max Pierre-Louis signing off. Natalia Wovskotrajka, thank you so much for all this time and qualities and remarks, Brett. Okay. And thank you to, to all. This is Brett Levitt from Family Reconcile saying so long.